Mm, things to do. Okay, so I get to introduce, introduce three really amazing guests. The first of which being Amanda Tajine. She is a, a Navajo from, Cana from Ganada, Arizona. Yeah. She is an assistant professor in educational leadership and innovation at Arizona State University. She's the author of the award-winning book, Native Presence and Sovereignty in College, Sustaining Indigenous Weapons to Defeat Systemic Monsters. She has published thought pieces in The Hill, Teen Vogue, Indian Country Today, Inside Higher Ed, Navajo Times, and in Marvel Comics. <laughs> We also have Johanna Williams. She is the Senior Director of Research at Search Institute, a nonprofit organization that promotes positive youth development and advances equity through applied research and collaborative partnerships with youth serving organizations. She has had the privilege of working with and for youth in many capacities as a teacher, a youth development program staff member, and researcher. She has served as a tenured faculty member at University of Virginia and Rutgers University, where she cultivated her research skills with a focus on issues of racial equity, identity, and positive of youth development. And then lastly, we have Gael Etor. He is an award-winning podcast producer and the creator of the Teenage Therapy Podcast, which boasts over one million followers. He has hosted high-profile guests, including Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, as well as the, as well as the US Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. Etor is the co-founder of Asher Studios, a podcast network dedicated to producing mental health content for adolescents. We also work together at the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. Mm. Welcoming our three guests. Yeah. They're not going to come out unless you give more energy. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for such a kind introduction. Uh, so many familiar faces, but for those that don't know me, my name is Gaio Ator. And first of all, thank you so much to everyone for being so engaged and for all the youth that are here who are advocating for the issues that we're facing in our day-to-day -day life. Um, thank you. So I want to start with an observation. And I noticed that seeing a lot of research happen and, and working with researchers, I feel like research can often feel like it's extracting from vulnerable communities and vulnerable youth. You know, researchers go in there, they get their data, they get their numbers, and then they kind of just leave. Why? Right? I, I think that there's these young people that are so courageous and we're using our pain and our suffering and our story with the hopes that we can make this country better. But oftentimes, we never actually get to see the fruits of our labor. By the time that there's new policies or initiatives that come about, we're too old to take advantage of them in the way that we wish we could have. And so, I think researchers, frankly, can be doing more than a $25 gift card. Um, and so first, I want to start um, with you, Joanna. You're, you're a researcher. You do this work for a living. You understand it better than most. And so what do you think that researchers can be doing to better support vulnerable youth and communities, both while the research is occurring and beyond? Thank you so much. Thanks, Gael, for the question. And thanks for having me here. Um, I want to start by uh, having us think a little bit about equity and what it means in the context of research. So we might think about equity as the allocating resources, supports, and opportunities appropriately so that we all have what we need to thrive. And then we need to look critically in research at, you know, what are we not allocating? Um, and how might research be getting in the way of thriving, um, even when it's intended to do the opposite? Attention to equity in research requires deep consideration of how and why research is conducted uh, and the impacts it has. So to create equity and elevate young people through research, we need to start by examining issues of power and positionality. For instance, who gets to determine the research questions that are considered most pressing? Extractive research centers the curiosities and interests of the researcher uh, while collaborative and community-engaged research centers the questions and interests of communities. And that's really, I think, an important starting place. We also need to think critically about the goals of research. How might research be used to disrupt inequities in access 
and in opportunities and outcomes rather than just documenting them. We're really good as researchers at documenting problems that exist, but we need to think about using research to challenge um, and disrupt those problems. <clears throat> when we're taking stock of research that currently has already been produced, um, and when we're drawing conclusions from existing research, I think we always need to remember that research contains lots of biases. There's biases in who's been included, in how it gets interpreted, in who had the power to even conduct the research. So we can't treat research as if it's the only valid truth or that it's more important than people's lived experiences. When we're using research to better understand inequities, we need to acknowledge the structural and historical sources of those inequities. So when my colleague and friend, Adriana Galvan, was up here earlier, she mentioned our council report on the intersection of um, adolescent development and anti-black racism. Um, in that report, which is posted on the Hoover app, um, we discuss how the developmental needs and goals that are shared by all young people and that Adriana talked about. So uh, we all need experiences and opportunities that shape and enhance our identity, um, that support our sense of belonging, that provide opportunities for agency and discovery. We discuss how these developmental goals are specifically impacted by interpersonal, structural, and anti-black racism. And it's really important, I think, to make this distinction. Black youth, for example, have the same developmental goals um, and as all young people. They have the same developmental needs that Adriana talked about. Um, but there are multiple ways in which the context of racism shapes access to whether and how these needs are actually met. And our history of not making these connections in research is a huge contributor to pervasive narratives um, that are deficit-focused and damage-centered. So if we don't acknowledge the structural, historical causes of inequities, then we're left with assumptions that locate the problems of these outcomes within young people themselves. Not acknowledging and unpacking systemic drivers of inequality has caused similar harm for youth from groups who experience marginalization because of their citizenship status, because of their sexual identity, their religion, their socioeconomic standing, and so on. So those connections are really important. Um, I'll wrap up by encouraging us to continue asking the question, to whom are we accountable when conducting research in service of equitable access and outcomes? And I also want to really encourage us to begin any research inquiry by centering the strengths, assets, and funds of knowledge that all youth and communities possess. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's <laughs> incredible. And so you're right. I mean, whoever tells the story holds the power. And uh, moving on to the storytelling aspect of it is um, you, Amanda. You are a storyteller by heart. You, you do this for a living, and you've seen the way that storytelling can be used and twisted to give people power or take away. So, in your opinion, how have you seen storytelling be used for both good and bad? Uh, yeah, thank you for that generous conversation. And, and Joanna dropped the mic on her response to, I'm really excited to be here today and thank you for the organizers because storytelling, man, I love storytelling. Uh, yeah, I hear some woot woot out there. You know, I'm gonna start with a story. story. When I was 17 years old, I was a high school senior student council president in a small rural reservation on the Navajo Nation with about maybe 500 students total in the high school. And I didn't know at the time that my high school vice principal was racist because I didn't know the language to it at that time. But I started feeling it in the ways that sh the school and her in particular were creating these rules such as closing off bathrooms and we had only three bathrooms in this high school, y'all, and there's 500 students, and we had a three-minute um, change of time to our next class. They shut down one of the bathrooms, so then we only had two. So you're running to the bathroom sometimes and waiting in line, and this bathroom, we only had like three stalls, and one of them had two stalls in it. And so then I was, as pres president of student council, like, this is not right. We're either gonna be late to class, which then we get penalized again, or we're gonna have to hold it, and there's health challenges with that. What do we do? And so time and time again, I went to my principal to like fight for, I felt what was right for us as students in this, in this school. 
so many other policies now that I think about it when I was young that I realized that was really taking away the way that we can be, have fun during high school. My last year, week in high school, you know, when you're signing yearbooks and you're saying your little notes in there, we're sitting in the high school hallway and the vice principal sat down by me. And she's like, Amanda, where are you gonna go after this? And I said, I'm going to high, I'm gonna go to college. And she told me, well, I just want you to know wherever you go, you're gonna be nothing. And I didn't even know what to say at that time. I remember she just got up and she just walked off. And sometimes I think, God, I should have said this, I should have done this, I should have. But you know, as a 17 year old, I just, I feel like, you know, I did what I knew what to do. Fast forward, that's a story. So then it inspired me to like, I'm not the only one out there who's dealing with ongoing ways, racism and the ways that make us shape who belongs in places and who doesn't belong in places and the ways in which we can tell stories to demonstrate to these systems that we belong, right? And so fast forward research then is a part of storytelling. And so I'm like, so I say I love to tell this story because now it's a book. And I wrote a book about 10 Native youth and their experiences. And they all told me similar stories of feeling racism and erased from society, not included in the dialogue about what, who, who the first people of this place are not accounted for. They told these in real ways. And so I'm here to tell you that story is a legitimate tool of knowledge system that has been passed down from generations of generations that makes us who we are today. And I want to underscore the impact that when we're talking about policies, we're often thinking about big data. And there's a reason for that, and I'll go into history of that, but it's built on racism, that devalues the depth and expansive of stories that connects to contextual issues, social political dimensions, histories of exclusion and erasure. Stories allows for that abundance to occur. And so I'm really happy that y'all are here to share the stories that you want to be told because you don't have to tell everything there's a trust involved in who gets to hear your story and when it's going to be told. Wow. Well said. Amanda, that, that is beautiful. I, look, I'm a storyteller myself. You know, I, to tell my story to all of you, I, when I was 15, I started a podcast alongside four of my friends where we committed to gathering every single week and simply telling our story to one another, talking about our issues with depression, sexuality, heartbreak, belonging, purpose. And, and we did that every single week in, in a raw and in a vulnerable way. We cried on the podcast, we argued, we found resolution and, and, and solace within one another. And to this day, I credit that experience and, and that bedroom where we sat around the couch with a camera and a mic in the middle with helping me survive adolescence. And because the truth is, to own your story is powerful. And not simply to use it as a weapon for a political agenda, but as release, as a healing tool. And, and that's what storytelling can be. It's not only healing for ourselves, it's healing for our communities. And it has been ever since humanity has existed. And to this day, I really believe that what we need is to encourage more young people to tell their stories and researchers as well have a place in this because research needs to be done with youth, not to them. And so as we move on to solutions, I wanna tell you about what I wanna see in the world and the solution that I'm working on. And it's to bring that feeling of home, the comfort of, of being a teenager that's confused and lost and sitting in your bedroom or your living room with your friends in the dead of night talking for hours. An experience that is a privilege that not every youth gets to have. Although they should. They should. And the reason they don't get to have that is because they don't have the spaces for it. There's no space that isn't school or work where a young person that doesn't feel comfortable at home or supported at school can go to meet other people like them. They're isolated. We give them no spaces and wonder why we're always online. That makes no sense. We're in a loneliness epidemic. How does that change? 
it changes when we go offline. And so what I want to do is I want to create the spaces that feel like that feeling of home, places that are permanent in our communities, that isn't a pop-up. It's not a two-week thing. It's not a three-week thing. It is a space where you know it will be there for your entire adolescence and where you could come in and it doesn't feel like an institution. It doesn't feel like a conference room. It just feels like a home, a warm place where there's young people that are willing to listen to you, that are willing to share their story with you, and you feel seen and you feel heard. Because my lived experience taught me that that simple act of telling your story can save a life. And so as we continue forward, I believe we can bring that all over the country. You know? and, and programs like AA has shown how powerful storytelling can be. Why don't we have emotional support networks like that for young people? That's the next step in this. That's the next step. And so, bringing it back to solutions. Thank you. Thank you. What are the solutions that both of you want to see occur in research and storytelling? Yeah, you know, I'm reading a really amazing book right now on the plane over, and it's... Um, and it's called, I'm actually looking at my notes to make sure, Ruth Benjamin, and it's Imagination, a Manifesto. And in that, there's a quote by Robin D.G. Kelly that says, the map to a new world is in the imagination. And so our beginning, beginning plenary talked a lot about um, a task force, which I'm so excited about. And, and then I heard um, Secretary Cardona mention that will they'll help set the tone of the issues to come to play. And so I think that's an important part of the solution aspect, but I also want to just push it a little bit longer. Is like who is allowed to be a part of the task force and who is it? I think is really critical to think about the questions that Joanna raised. But I'm also thinking about then the issues, because the issue is going to set the terms of the debate of what's going to incur. So that's why it's really critical in that story collection. That's where story collection happens. So I'm hoping that in that time frame, when folks are gathering stories, that you imagine futures. You make a map toward futures that's building upon what is possible, but recognizing that those futures in many ways are connected to the past, that's connected to the present. Because sometimes we like to say the language of we're reimagining something. It's a rebirth. It's a rebuilding. What we fail to recognize is that some people have been saying this for centuries. And we're excluding those knowledge systems that have been operating in a way that's collective and in solidarity with others. So I want you to think about those when you're thinking about issues, about the ways, what are your solutions, and thinking of the futures that's drawing to the history and to the presence. So I'm just going to follow on to what Gael said and Cherie, when Cherie was sitting here earlier, said about, you know, whose voice gets heard in the process of research. Um, so research needs to be done with and for young people and not on them. Um, so we need to think about them as partners and creators of research rather than as subjects of research. We also need to think carefully about how young people are being positioned and described in research. Uh, we need to push harder to understand how research can honor the strengths and assets that young people possess um, and use it to uplift humanity rather than perpetuate harmful narratives. Um, we also need to acknowledge, so research has a tendency to look at sort of averages and look at really high levels of group demographics, but we need to understand that we're talking about individuals with lived experiences and that we need to go beyond demographic labels to understand the diversity that all of us possess in our day-to-day -day lived experience beyond the assumptions that might be attached to particular labels or zip codes. Last, I'll say that young people, I think in particular, need to be included in how the research gets interpreted and shared out. That has been a failure of the sort of research academy um, in that we haven't been responsible for understanding the implications of just very simple findings that we think sort of make sense because then, you know, our partners in the media can take them and run with them and, you know, restory them in any way that they want. So I think having young people at the table to help us really think about, you know, what do we need to say? What have we learned? What have we not learned? And what should we not say when we're building um, 
narratives from research. I think that is uh, creating opportunities for access to power in shaping the narrative that is connected back to research. So, thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you. And so, as we close today and as we close this panel, I just wanna leave you with one final um, thought, and that's that young people deserve a place where we can simply exist. And so what can each of you do to help us create those spaces? Um, and the first step is listening, but like we said, action. Action is what we need. How can you help us fund it? How can you connect us? How can you put us in touch with the people that are gonna create this? So thank you all for listening. <laughs>